Hi, I'm Jason Rona, and this is one of my favorite RC products of all time. The Team Associated RC10. I'm sure a lot of people were wondering when we were going to get to this vehicle, uh, but definitely one of the favorites of all time, one of my personal favorites, and it's definitely probably, um, you know, been one of the most iconic vehicles that has ever been in, in the RC racing scene. Uh, this is really the blueprint for building a 110 scale off-road buggy. And going through the years, going from where we started with this RC10 all the way to where we are today, you can see the, the trails that this car has left uh, throughout every vehicle uh, that's in the competitive racing scene. And uh, this is probably um, you know, a vehicle that inspired so many people to get into RC for some reason when this was developed and um, sold in the early 80s, uh, it became sort of a, a, a cult classic, a cult favorite. Um, when you see people refer to radio control cars, they always say, I had that gold pan RC10. That was, that's something that I see constantly out on the races, out at the track, uh, when you're viewing social media, when you're on YouTube, you always see people say, I had the Gold Pan RC10. And it really goes to show you uh, um, how innovative this vehicle was and um, how forward thinking some of the, the designers were on this project. And kind of going back a step, uh, you know, into the early 80s uh, when Team Associated just started to come. Uh, into being a larger company, there was Roger Curtis, Gene Husting, Curtis Husting, Mike Reedy, Jay Halsey, Gil Losey Jr., and Jim Halsey. A lot of influential figures in the RC racing scene, but they had their uh, fingerprints all over this vehicle. And you say Gil Losey Jr., I know he well, was an um, instrumental factor in this vehicle as well. He was a driver, a racer. And uh, when they prototyped and they went and raced this car, they won the first ever Roar Off-Road Nationals. Uh, he was one of the drivers at that time, uh, along with, of course, Jay Halsey, who won the race. But um, there's a video that you can actually see on YouTube uh, of uh, that used to come with the RC10 vehicles uh, that had Roger Curtis uh, describe his design inspiration on this vehicle which was uh, him and Gene went to a real off-road vehicle type show convention in California. I believe it's called a SCORE event or something like that. And they picked out a vehicle that they felt they wanted to design the RC-10 after. And they went from there. Roger started making the drawings for this RC-10. He said he drew a horizontal line across the, the paper, and he said he didn't want anything to hang below that line uh, that he drew on the paper, which uh, you can see right off the bat when you have this car, that's the thing you notice right away. The, the bottom of the chassis is that line that he drew. And then from there, he started creating his suspension and transmission. And, and in those days, uh, there wasn't the, the high-tech CAD software like we have today where you can draw in three dimension or draw in, um, you know, in these models and assemble things. At that time, you had to think in three dimension and you had to draw in two dimension. And in, the, in this case of the RC-10, there's drawings that Associate has shown over the years of this vehicle uh, being drawn by Roger and, and the crew there. And it went through many versions. I know... Um, when we talked to Curtis Husting on the Radio Impound podcast, he said he was an apprentice uh, machinist there at Associated. He kind of developed into the role of the senior guy, and Roger started delivering these plans to him to design this RC or to build this RC10, which was, hey, machine us some A arms, machine us uh, the chassis. And uh, Curtis goes on to tell us in this podcast that you know they initially took this chassis design and they had to hammer it out over a die, and he kind of hand-created the very first original car, which they had in their hands. This was their CAD model at the time, which was this vehicle you could hold, and they could say, okay, let's go from here. Now we need to design our own shocks, our type of things, you know, add our own wheels, and really see what this vehicle could do. 
So the RC10, just some of the things I want to point out about this car that uh, just stick out to me right away. People sometimes they tell me, man, it's amazing how far these cars have come. But when I look at them, I see the, the similarities between them all. With the RC10, you look at this right away and you say, okay, well, uh, it's easy to say four shocks, four wheels, four tires. That's the joke. You can only make it so many different ways. But with this car, like a dual, dual steering bell crank setup here in the front, 30 degrees of kick up on the chassis, which now pretty much every car has that same uh, setup. We have a, you know, an independent front suspension. We have an upper um, camber link here, which on this car, it also has a caster block, which has a reduced amount of caster compared to the kick up. You know, in these days they, they were in the 10, 15 de degree range out here. You know, now we're in the 25 degree range, but this became adjustable over time and the different versions of the RC10 as we'll go over here, um, they, they made changes here, but upper link, you know, steering tie rod, um, dual bell crank setup. Then you look here in the, the steering blocks, they had an offset steering block. It's not in line with the Kingpin, it's offset, which is um, one of the design details of the cars we still use today. And then you start to go through the chassis it was, chassis on this thing was actually adjustable. Um, there was a time when they they set this up where you could actually make the kick up longer and make the chassis longer. But anyway, um, the way they set up this chassis was uh, initially the battery was, I believe they call it transverse. So the battery was mounted like this. Uh, speed control was only, uh, at the time when they started, it was a wiper mechanical speed control servo. But we had our servo here. We had our battery here and our you know speed control went where it would fit. They were so big in the receiver. You get back to the rear, we got suspension mounts on the inside. Same thing we're using today. Uh, I think at the time they didn't have a much, if any, toe-in built into the inside, but there was anti-squat built into this uh, inner mount, which today uh, on the, the B6 and you know the low C 5.0 Elite, Yokomo cars, all these cars we use today, you know, they have uh, pills and shims in here to change all this, uh, all these dimensions. But this car was the blueprint. This was where we started. It had adjustable wheelbase. It has a rear hub carrier, which we use today, no, no different. And, and then an upper uh, camber link, control link here, which then they also had multiple locations on the rear bulkhead to control. You could change your roll center, you could change your camber gain, and all these adjustments were already on the very first RC10. Of course, shock tower, shocks, oil-filled shocks, which was a big deal then. At the time, there was a lot of friction-type shocks, like the Tamiya cars. These were actually oil-filled. I think there were guys that didn't actually know you could use oil in those days, but, um, but I think the fast guys, Jay Halsey and them, uh, they knew how to tune them with oil. And then you get into the transmission. This was a six gear transmission. Uh, the outdrive's located all the way at the base. Dog bone comes out into the outdrive. Same principle we have today. Uh, the angle might be slightly different to what we're using on the current cars, but this is the same, almost identical setup to what we're using. You know, dimensions, heights may vary, but the way this is all built is the same. The difference here with the six gear tranny, which Roger had to design this, as Curtis told us, was he designed this transmission in 2D on paper, and he put the differential up here, which was something that uh, he told us that Associated and their on-road uh, team kind of developed was a differential on the on-road pan cars, and they incorporated that into the off-road car. So the car had a differential, which was something that was uh, very important to these cars turning and you know, making nice radius corners that have that differential. So over the years, this design has been refined, especially in the RC10 lineup, but you can see all the uh, the blueprints are right here for building an off-road race car, and it came from this vehicle. One thing I even like to point out to people is one of the tuning things that's so common these days is guys decide if they're going to run a gull wing front arm or a flat front arm and the uh, RC10 was actually a gull wing front arm setup which was something you know these days um, 
you know, people talk about as a tuning thing. This car was also set up to use uh, sway bars. You know, you could put a sway bar on the front of this thing. So, um, and I believe you could even do it on the rear. It wasn't as uh, common to use them back then as it is today, but uh, this car was set up to do it. So this was the A-Stamp original RC10. Uh, really the, the tires um, that came with it, I think guys really struggled in the tire department for several years until things started catching up. But uh, then you can see here we have a bunch of cars lined up. And when you look at these cars, uh, we got a couple kit boxes here. Uh, we got the original RC10. They made a championship edition, uh, which they made small upgrades. They went to a longer front arm. That was a big upgrade for them. They changed the wheel size. They started incorporating that into the kits, which was a 2.0 size wheel. Then the tires started to develop hard anodized shocks. Uh, then we then they went to the point where they had the graphite chassis. So it was a graphite RC10, which if you're ever on eBay, one of the hardest ones you can source or find a brand new one of is an RC10 graphite. Very difficult to find this car um, untouched and the chassis brand new. So the RC10 graphite, which was a little bit of a departure for them, I think that was maybe inspired by the success of some of the Losi cars who came with the graphite chassis. They felt, hey, we could get away from this aluminum chassis, all the prep work and all the headaches that it caused them to make this chassis in the kit. They tried it with the, the carbon fiber and I think it was a popular car, but in the end they decided that this car uh, was better with the aluminum chassis and uh, you know Curtis explained to us the the difficulty that they had in, in building these chassis they they would stamp them they they were just fresh metal they'd come in they'd be twisted they'd have to hammer them flat then they'd have to uh, send it through a, a series of processes to harden it they had to countersink the chassis anodize them and it was a big process to get these chassis built and in the kits back then. And, and I want to say one of the limiting factors to how many cars they could build was how many chassis they could make. So, uh, you know, he explained to us that this particular chassis and everything was um, was the most probably the most difficult uh, item that they put with the car. But they also felt like using these engineering materials, as Roger would call them, you know, aircraft aluminum, 6061 uh, aluminum, and then nylon based injection molded parts, fiberglass towers. There was really kind of not a lot of cars in the business at that time that used these kind of engineering uh, type plastics and materials. So uh, they felt that was the edge and they, and they wanted to maintain that over the years until plastics got so good and the molding became so precision that you could build a much better uh, chassis um, out of plastic at that time. So moving along, like I said, many different variations from this car from when it won the first ever world championships with Jay Halsey in 1985. Um, you know, went through variations to the point where they had these different kits, championship edition, graphite edition. Um, you know, there was even a TQ10, they call it, which was something they worked out with the distributor I believe it was Horizon. They sold a, a vehicle called the TQ10. Came with different tires, body, and uh, outfitted a little different with the chassis, I believe. And there was several different versions. This was so popular of a vehicle. Uh, Curtis mentioned to us that he has no idea how many they sold of these. He said all he knows is they were back ordered for over three years and they could never make enough RC10s. So moving along, I think... We get into the driver history of this car. We talked about Jay Halsey being sort of instrumental in the design. Uh, Gilosi Jr. was in there, uh, Curtis Husting uh, driving, and uh, even Roger and Gene did their fair share of driving, uh, getting this thing up to speed. But um, then we, we got into a, a different generation with uh, Cliff Lett entering the picture. He went to work at Associated in 1987. And that's when a lot of these upgrades started happening to the vehicle. I think Cliff's um, motocross experience and his um, suspension tuning, and he was approaching driving from a different angle than some of the other guys. He became really good with uh, jumping the car. At that time, the tracks weren't as uh, technical 
as they became over the years, and Cliff really mastered the mechanics of the car, the suspension, and then the driving and the jumping, as uh, several people have, have told me. So with Cliff entering the picture, he was kind of that, uh, him and Halsey became that one-two punch where uh, and Cliff actually started, I think, overtaking him, maybe just on track time, working at Associated, being that guy, where it got to the point where he was the the sought-after racer, the guys people were going after. He was really making a name for the RC10, you know, in the early 90s. And then they um, worked together on the stealth transmission. I believe that was one of the, the big additions they made to this car over the years was they went from the six-gear transmission to the three-gear stealth transmission that had a slipper on it. And that was a huge upgrade to the vehicle. So we had went from the original to the longer front arms, graphite chassis, tub chassis, hard anodized shocks. Then we went to the stealth transmission, which the stealth transmission with the slipper, the guys that raced in that era will tell you that was probably where they started the word game changer because they really felt that the stealth just completely changed this car. They With the slipper, it saved the drivetrain. It just made the car easier to drive. It made the car a better handling vehicle. And then the Stealth became sort of their trademark between the transmission name, starting to name prototype cars Stealth, and then incorporating that transmission style into later vehicles down the road. But um, you can see as the cars progressed along, in the early 90s then we got to the point where uh kind of another driver change changing of the guard we had the masami hirosaka he always raced for associated he was so good with the rc10 winning reedy race of champions all the japanese nationals really competitive at the worlds uh winning with um you know different variations of associated platform cars you know of course they made prototypes he won worlds with but it came down to the, the 93 Worlds. I believe Associated was designing a gas truck, the RC10 GT. They went to the Worlds in, in England, and now we had a kind of a, tr a driver change, a changing of the guard with Brian Kinwall coming in to the picture. And Brian qualified eighth at that race, and um, but he told me that they went through um, a little bit of handling trouble. Uh, they weren't quite prepared for the bumpy big track there in England. He said he barely got into the main and they went to the, which was kind of ironic, the low C designed hydro drive. Put the hydro drive on his RC10 and at that point the car itself, uh, you know, he had it very customized and it was a really, really nice looking piece. Um, but he took it from eighth on the starting grid, one, um, the IFMAR World Championships there in 93 with the RC10, and shortly thereafter, they came out with another variation of the RC10, the world's car. They put Brian's uh, car uh, on the box, his paint job at the time, and I believe that was probably the crowning uh, achievement of that vehicle was starting in 1984-85, winning there, and then Brian winning the 93 Worlds with it. And I just remember um, him kind of establishing himself as now the, the driver to beat. And uh, people really flocked to him and really put together, tried to put, assemble a car that looked like his in performance and um, all of his little custom tweaks that he would do over the years. So, But uh, another successful car, the world's car, I think it was the first um, associated vehicle that came with uh, uh, fluorescent yellow wheels. And it was definitely a little bit of a departure for them, but I think it was kind of neat uh, as it was about 1994 when I received mine from Associated, built it up, and uh, it was, again, another uh, version of the RC10. But still, so many parts were exactly the same as the original and that they had so much success with. And, you know, and from there, I think the car from 94 and then towards the end of 94 was... Uh, kind of Mark Pavitas' time. There was another changing of the guard. Kinwald moved on to Losi, and uh, Mark Pavitas became the, the top associated driver and really carried that RC10 to, uh, you know, Reedy, uh, two-wheel drive class victories, victories at the Winter Champs, won the World's Warm-Up, 
with the car, and I believe he retired it. He said in a, a race in Tacoma, Washington, he uh, he was able to win there the last time with the RC10 versus I believe it was uh, Ken Wald and the guys running the double X. He said he put the RC10 to bed with a win, and then after that came the RC10 B2. But that was you know a terrific run from 85. Um, 84 to you know the uh, the 94 season so about a 10 year run with um, variations of that platform and and I think uh, Mark was probably the last guy him and uh, Matt Francis several other guys that you know we were on the team at the time uh, really I think it was time for a new car just almost out of boredom um, we had gotten to the point where we could only customize it so much and that was probably the trademark of having one of these RC10s was how much you could individualize it with your own colors, the way you would prep things, build things. And that's kind of why we brought out, you know, another couple of vehicles here. You know, this is a, a, a recreation of a, a Mark Pavitas build. And, you know, in the early 90s, it was popular to be the Team Moo uh, paint job. And uh, Mark kind of take it, took it another step and uh, did his whole chassis uh, where it had the, the Moo spots on it. And you could see at the time, um, and this is a car um, that was built to look like Mark's. Uh, this was built by Jason Suntos, and I purchased it from him because I, I love the, the way this thing looked. But, um, you know, custom trim nose piece, trim the nose brace tubes. You cut the whole chassis down a little bit fine sand the, the front, titanium turnbuckles, 25 degree caster blocks. Then you custom make your own battery brace. That This one here is fiberglass, but you know, a lot of us would build them out of carbon fiber. Um, you know, then we started switching up colors. We started you know, mix matching um, the standard nylon plastic. We started dyeing parts so they had different colors. And then you know, placing them in different areas on the car. So it was just you know, kind of to make yours look different and unique, this is the kind of things we would do. Finish the motor plates, the back of the chassis, and uh, mount your antenna in different places. I mean, uh, mill the inside of the chassis with slots, things that became so uh, critical to show how good you are with, with building a car and what you're, you know, what you're capable of. You know, this is another car here that we built uh, again, you know, we wanted to make it different. This would be something somebody would do is anodize the chassis blue and then go right back through the car again, you know, you know, individualizing the, the whole thing so that it was just, it became your own. How you wanted to do carbon towers? Did you want to, you know, have certain plastic colors here or there? Did you stagger things out? You know, how did you do it? And, and then of course the, the bodies for these cars, there was, you know, they had, uh, Protex, Protec 2, Vipers, Sidewinders, RCPS had the Mirage, the Turbo Mirage, and all these different bodies that were so popular. You know, we even made a detonator body uh, for the original RC10 Classic. Then we made the Detonator Worlds because we had to have a couple bodies for the for the re-releases. So over the years, you can see what made this car so fun was. It was kind of the hobbyist car. It was the one that you could race with, you could be competitive with, and then you could turn around, you could make it your own. You could make it look like however you wanted. You could change things, anodize it. Um, just, it was really kind of the endless um, fun car, the endless build. Um, you could change something every week, you could modify it, and, and it really took on the look of, of your personality, what you thought was cool. And, um, you know, another car that I brought out here, just to kind of go back to a point, is we got the RC10 B5, which was probably the last comparison we'll bring up with the original RC10 here, because this was probably the last generation associated car that was rear motor. And you can see here, you know, looking at the car, you know, we got a wheelbase and a width difference. The cars have grown in size. To a maximum of under the rules but you can see you know bell cranks steering bell cranks double you know double bell cranks 
we got the 30 degree kick up as we talked about earlier we got um, you know this car has flat arms but there was the option later to go to the gull wings like this car uh, you move back servo servo was here we got the battery here battery was here speed control and a receiver on the b5 a lot of guys would put the speed control or the receiver on the shock tower on the rc10 move back we got a suspension mounts on the sides of the transmission we got the the universal or the cvas that they they use here now into a, a hub carrier and a very same setup as this motor boom right here behind the transmission kind of tucked in as even the original was designed where the motor could tuck up against the transmission and the same thing we had here on the b5 you know since then we've went to Pretty much every car is a mid-motor car now where we've turned the transmission around, but it all started with the blueprint here of the RC10, and uh, definitely one of my favorite RC cars of all time, definitely the most influential of all time, and uh, definitely enjoyed being a part of uh, that generation of racing that car in uh, you know, late 80s, early 90s, and uh, we had a great time. Really appreciate everybody staying tuned. If you like this video, remember, give us a like, subscribe, ring that bell, and uh, definitely share this on social media. And uh, let's uh, give a like here for RC cars and the RC10 here in general.